The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Last week we started a five-part series on preparing our hearts for Christmas. And so many uh, in the day of Christ, they, they missed His coming. They, they, they were busy. There was no room at the inn. There was moralism and they, they missed, the Pharisees missed uh, what was coming. And so I want us to have full hearts as we celebrate a full Christ who has come into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And we began last week by looking at the first promise of this Savior in the Bible. And we looked at Genesis 3 and we saw where, where Adam and Eve sinned and they took this whole human race into ruin. And they, they lost having God at the center of everything. The way everything functions rightly is when everything is, is orbits around God. It has its focus and it finds its purpose and its meaning in God. And it's just such a shift now that you you moved away from God to self and destruction came into every relationship as a result. And then the curse that God would bring upon the world that all relationships now are broken between him and man and, and one another and nature. Yet in the middle of this cursing, the devil and the serpent in Genesis 3 God is a lot like me. I I cannot keep presence a secret. I'm just terrible at it. My wife's never had one surprise in her life. (laughs) It's as if God could not keep this one back. That the reason and purpose right there for the fall was for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ to undo the work of the devil in the garden in Genesis 3. He breaks out right in the middle. And in the most glorious and wonderful way, he says, the devil... You're going to, I'm going to send a seed called he who's going to be Jesus and you're going to bruise him on the heel and he's going to crush you over the head. He's going to come and destroy the work that you just did. You will be crushed by the seed that will come from Eve and he will bring men back to paradise, back to God. What a promise for this fallen world and humanity that we live in. So we have this glorious promise right out of the gate that will now unfold in the rest of redemptive history. This morning, we're going to continue flushing out that seed then that was promised in Genesis 3 that would come and bring restoration. And we're learning who it would be and what he would do. And as he has now been introduced to us as the protagonist of the history of redemption, Christ Jesus... He's going to be the focal point now of everything, the one that God is going to sum up everything in Christ Jesus. And so Jesus Christ is the centerpiece, the focal point of everything. And so if you would, then turn with me this morning to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and this morning we're going to learn about Abraham and the beautiful promise that was made to him. And we'll see more this morning of how amazing and beautiful and fulfilling that baby was that lay in a manger on Christmas morning that we're journeying uh, to glory together with on December 23rd. I think it is that last Sunday before Christmas or the 24th. So let's go before God and and pray uh, over the beauty of what's before us this morning. Father, we come before you and I, I can't get over what we saw in Genesis 3. I thank you that you're going to reverse the curse and the destruction that the devil brought into this world. And I thank you that it it was working according to your perfect plan. While the devil sat there smug, you let him know that there's going to be a seed that's going to come and crush his head, that you're going to bring a redemption to this world. And so, God, we thank you that this plan was better than just wiping out and destroying the devil right then in that garden. But he was your little lackey playing according to what would give you more glory than anything possible. God, we thank you for this beautiful plan. We thank you that you've brought us into it. And I pray that every believer this morning would glory in Jesus Christ, that you would meet us here in the Word as we just sang these ancient words, God, that they would be made living and active in our heart this morning and that faith would bubble up in every heart and that we would uh, rejoice and sing joy to the world. God, thank you for Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we do pray, amen. Well, last week we looked at the fall of mankind, paradise, and we now have a cherubim 
with a flaming sword that moves in every direction that no one can get back to the tree of life. You can't get back into the presence of God through this sword of justice. Sin has made it where uh, we have been kicked out of the favorable, favorable presence of God. We, we can't get back in except through the sword of justice. And the most destructive part of the fall was that we were separated from God. We were made for God and we've been separated. And that is again where everything finds its purpose and its meaning is God. Without being rightly re related to God, we're going to be broken in our lives we're going to have shame and guilt. We'll make fig leaves and we'll hide from God when he comes back into the garden. And so the fall has ruined our relationship with God. And now we're broken in our relationships. Adam throws Eve under the bus, the woman you gave me. And now the woman your desire will be for your husband, yet he'll rule over you. It's the brokenness of marriage and the battle of the sexes that we've seen ever since. We're broken with, with nature itself and it fights against us instead of providing for us. Because in Genesis, we're told that we were created in God's image. We were made for him and my heart will always be restless until I find my rest in thee, O oh God. So the brokenness of every life is you've been separated from what you were made for and you're restless and you're looking to find life in something other than God. Mankind has spent the rest of history trying to make its way back to God. We're trying to patch up our brokenness because we've lost God as the center reference point to life. And we're trying all to figure out, how can I have a relationship then with my creator? And thinking through it this week, there's just so many different schools of thought on how to do this. One view is God's just this benevolent grandfather it's his job to be nice to us. It's his job to forgive us. And we got this little mushy God who's just always there and he owes us forgiveness and he can't be happy without us. He has to have us. Another view is deism, that God is so great, he's transcended. He transcends his creation. He's infinite. He can't concern himself then with our existence and our day-to-day -day needs. He's upholding the universe after all. He's just kind of wound it up like a watch and he's just letting this thing unfold by purpose and chance and he's just transcendent and distant. The other view, I think the most prevalent today is he's a back-scratching God. Many, many gods in pantheism and they're all finite. Humans would, would make a temple to one of these gods and give the deity what he wants and then he would give them what they want. The, the God of Neptune in the sea if, you, if you're going on a, a trip and you're going to travel, you, you'd go make an offering so you would get mercy on the sea while you traveled. They would give sacrifices to Hermes. It, it would scratch my back and you scratch yours. You know what I'm trying to say. This one caught on greatly in our day and age, though, but we call our gods by different names. God, if you get me out of this, I'll, I'll be a priest. If I have daily devotions, you're going to give me a long life and no cancer. If I seek to be honest, you'll give me a spouse. If I work hard, I'll never lose my job. If I pray every day and put scriptures on my kid's lunchbox, my kids will never rebel. You scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And the church has many who live this way daily. Many who have walked that when, when the God they created in their own minds now doesn't scratch their back, they're angry and they, they walk away. What did the Jews do to fix this problem? Well, they, they had circumcision and if we just got circumcised and of Abraham, we're in the promise. They had a law, if we just keep it, you know, if we make all our rules, we can be right with God. People are always looking for a way to get back to God. And what I want you to see this morning is there's only one way back to God. There's only one way to be reconciled to God. There's, no, there's only one name under heaven by which a man can be saved. The true God is self-sufficient. He needs nothing to complete him. He doesn't need anything from us, so we can't even scratch his back. We can't appease him in anything that we would try or attempt to get back to God. That is the end of world religions. All of them are something that you got to do to scratch his back to get into his presence. I'm telling you, the scriptures declare from cover to cover, that's the wrong answer. If you've come this morning sitting in that answer, I'm about to give you the best news you've ever heard. So what is the remedy for the fall that we saw last week and the real results in our lives of 
guilt and shame and separation and the loss of God. Banishment from his presence. Is there any hope? And last week we saw, yes, that God's going to do something through the seed of Eve. Through that seed, God is going to crush the serpent's head. And this morning now, we're going to flesh it out a little bit more in Genesis chapter 12. <clears throat> if you'll look with me in verse 1. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and, the, and I will curse. The one who curses you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So let me fill in just a little more of the context then from last week. Right away after the fall then, the, the seeds, he said, will be at enmity with one another. And the next chapter, Cain kills Abel because he was righteous, and the battle instantly takes place. And then the human race begins to reproduce itself and grow. And God gives an assessment of what he sees as he looks out at his creation that he created. And in Genesis 6, 5, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> That's all I see is the wickedness is great and the intent of their hearts is evil continually, always. That's what comes out of man. And so God then brings a flood to flood this earth that has sin that's permeated it completely. And Noah and his family and the righteous ones, they're preserved on an ark from the judgment of God, which is very typological. Noah then gets drunk and the sin begins to spread again. In chapter 11, we have the Tower of Babel, where they build a tower which will reach into heaven. Man's attempts to, to get to God in their own efforts. Listen to Genesis 11:9. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. As they did this, God now scatters them, confuses their language, and spreads them over the world. This is very significant that our context this morning is that the nations have just been spread all over the world because of sin and separation from God. They're spread all over. What then is going to happen to the nations? Well, through these first 11 chapters, we've been told through Eve's seed, a believing seed, all who will come to Christ, who will crush the serpent's head, will be blessed. And we're going to follow this seed all the way through Genesis. And we're going to see faithful Seth in that line. And you're going to hear of all the different lines that will come. And they, they, they go off into sin. But there's the line. The line that the promise of God would come through. That the seed would come through this line. And that's the, the line that we're going to trace through the rest of Genesis. And I want you to look at chapter 11, verse 27. <coughs> Now, these are the records of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, who we're going to see as Abraham, Nahor and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah and the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran, and they settled there. These days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died uh, in Haran. So here now we're introduced to Terah. We will follow then his line the rest of the way through Genesis. He's going to have a son named Abraham, and Abraham will have Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, and that will be the rest of Genesis. But here we're going to arrive at Genesis 12, and we're being told that this line now has come to an end. 
It's come to an end. Sin is spreading through all the other lines. And this godly one that the seed is going to come from, it looks like it's died. The, the one ray of hope of this one line the, where God would bless the nations, this one single line, it does not look good at all. Terah, which means moon, which uh, he was into lunar worship. The last family, knowing who God was and what they were built for, now is engaged in idol worship. In Joshua 24, I want you to listen to verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, and they served other gods. They were worshiping the stars and the moons. And so they're worshiping something other than God. And so here the the great seed has drifted and they're worshiping idols. And they're supposed to go to Canaan and they stop short. They stay in Haran and they settled there and they're worshiping idols. And Sarah, Sarai, is barren and she has no children. Abraham is 75, so she's about 65 with no children. So you look at the line and you're like, done finished. No more seed, uh, no blessing, and they're worshiping idols instead of the living God. It just feels like done. The promise in Genesis 3 is a candle that just flickered out. And the human race has come to a dead end. Such promise, there is no way for this thing now to come forth. For he, the promised seed that would come, there's no way to get this done. My favorite two words, besides therefore, um, but now. Romans 3.21, the world lies in sin and death, but now what God did. And so we're sitting here with death and no hope. And now I want to show you the but now that happened in Genesis 12. Sovereign grace breaks in to the history of this world. And it's going to come and bring life out of death. That's the gospel in a nutshell. I'm going to bring life out of death. And we will see this pattern the rest of the way in the Old Testament history. It's going to look so many times like the promise is over. It's going to be put in bondage to the Egyptians for 400 years, and they're going to be conquered by Babylonians and Assyrians. And you're just going to keep watching this again and again. It looks like this promise is over, but God just keeps moving history to this climactic point of what we'll celebrate at Christmas. At the darkest time in history, when Christmas came, it had been 400 years since a prophet had received a word from God. Dead religion and sin was covering the earth, and an angel's going to come to Mary and say, the seed has arrived, it's in your womb, and it's just beautiful. So let's take up then what God did in Genesis 12. Uh, I've already read verses 1 through 3, and this, this gracious promise breaks in to such darkness. The one who is an idol worshiper, Abram, is now going to have his name changed to Abraham. And it was not uh, that he made himself worthy of such grace and blessing. I want you to see that the grace that's going to break into Abraham's life was not because he was worthy. He's worshiping idols. This man is unworthy of the grace of God like every one of us who sit here this morning. And so grace now comes not because you're worthy, but because God will make you worthy in his son. Free sovereign grace is the God who displays blessing upon whom he chooses. He initiates his plan and his purpose in every one of your lives. So by coming to Abram now, that is how anyone will ever come into blessing, is if the God of this universe comes and calls you and reveals himself to you, as we will see now in these verses. So I want to give you a brief outline God is going to promise three things to Abraham in these three verses. There's several things that he's promising. There's a lot more to the Abrahamic covenant. I'm just going to look at three aspects this morning for where we're journeying in our study. And the first thing I want you to see is I'm going to give you land. I'm going to give you land in verse 1. In verse 2, I'm going to make you, Abram, 75 years old. I'm going to make you a great nation. And then thirdly, in verse 3, through you... All the earth, your seed, all the earth will be blessed in you. And so I want to look at those three promises. Those are no small promises to an idol worshiper. It's not every day an idol worshiper gets those three promises brought from God. These are huge and they're extensive promises. No one in the history of the world received a promise like this 
from God. So be overwhelmed with what God's doing in this context. Abram will become now the central focus of the Bible from here on out. He, he's going to be called the great one. He's called a special chosen servant. He's called the friend of God. We're, we're called the children of Abraham, the God of Abraham. He's becoming the focal point of God's great salvation that would now extend to the ends of the earth. And so the blessings of God will come through Abraham's seed, and we will be called, he'll be called the father of the faithful, the father of all those who will have faith in this coming seed. So such an amazing event in history, and I want to take a brief look then at this promise to Abraham. I'm going to read verse 1 again. <clears throat> now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And so the call of God here is absolutely radical. He comes to Abram and says, go forth. In the literal Hebrew, it says, get out yourself. The King James Version says, get thee out. Your country, your relatives, your father's house, all that you've ever known, leave, Abraham, get up and go. The call of God for blessing comes to Abram. Here it is, leave everything, and I'm going to bless you abundantly. So there's a condition, you leave all for the call of God to receive the blessings that he has for you. He's calling them, abandon everything. Everything that you know and love and have ever found security in, I'm calling you to leave it, to find it, and receive it all from me. Abram, go forth to the land which I will show you. I love it. He's not given any geographical location. Just go. He, I'm sure he asked the question, where? Where? I'll show you. All I'm concerned about now is that you abandon everything for the call of God to receive the blessing that he wants to give to you. So radical. And it still is absolutely today. Come lose everything to gain everything. Jesus said, he who wishes to save his life in this world shall lose it. But he who loses his life for my name shall gain it. That is the radical call of God. And in Christianity, we've changed it. And we're letting you have both. And Jesus won't do that. He's calling you to abandon and leave everything in priority and heart to put this seed at the center of your affections and your hopes and joys and dreams. And it's just a radical call. Lose everything to find everything in Christ Jesus. You can't give him halfway. You can't pick the areas of your life that you want to give to him, the parts you want to hold back. This is a radical call to everyone. Leave everything for Jesus Christ. Or you can't be my disciple. Take up your cross and die. Or you can't follow after me. Early on in ministry, when I was evangelizing, I would get asked this a lot. And they would say, you know, I want to be a Christian, but what about this girl I'm dating who's an unbeliever? What about my materialism that I have? Do I have to stop doing this? Do I have to start doing this and be weird and go to church and all those things? And, and for so long, I was an idiot. I'd sit and answer those questions. <laughs> yeah, you got to quit doing this. You got to start doing... And I would just play right into their hands. But really what they were asking me is I want the salvation that you're talking about, but I want to stay in control. <laughs> I still want to sit behind the wheel. I still want to kind of have my own control. And to answer the call of God is you have to surrender everything. It's a treasure hidden in a field, and you sell everything that you can possess, this beautiful Jesus Christ. You have to give up your will. You have to get out of the driver's seat, and as uh, I think as Stephen Curtis Chapman, abandon it all for the sake of the call. You, you've got to abandon everything. He's asking for everything this morning. Everything. God says, go forth. Where? I'll tell you later. I'm going to give you a son, old Abraham. How? I'll tell you later. Go to Moriah and sacrifice your son. Why? I'll tell you later. This is a call to follow Christ and to receive the blessing of God eternally. What you're giving up is so small to what you're getting. You'll never get to heaven and say, I got cheated. I got everything. 
in Christ. He wants a complete takeover and a complete surrender to the seed that's going to be born in Bethlehem's manger. You can't ask, does it fit my agenda? I need to know, God, what you're going to ask of me first. It's a whole new life. Go forth. We live in the day and age of partial surrender to God. And Jesus is calling for all. And maybe that's what God's doing in your life right now as he's leading you to these places where he wants you to surrender everything and quit giving him leftovers like Cain. He wants your very best. He wants everything. When you see God as he really is, it destroys your consumer mentality of how can I use God? What's in it for me? And it sends you out. Abraham is going to be sent out. My life for yours. It's, it, it's transforming to see this God for who he is. You're going to quit using him. You can't use God. He uses you. I want you to listen to Hebrews 11.8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. I'm just following God. I don't even know where I'm going. That's my life. I'm just going wherever God says. I don't even know where sometimes. It's so sweet that the idol worshiper received the call of God and he obeyed his voice and he believed God and he acted upon his faith. I'm going to give you a land, Abraham, flowing with milk and honey. And secondly, I'm going to make you a great nation. If you'll read verse 2 with me. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. Uh, Verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I'll make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. And this is for free. We're blessed to be a blessing, right? It is, I'm going to bless you to bless the nations. So God blesses us with this gospel gift in Christ to go bless others. The ones who get out. And follow the call of God. You get out from your security zone and your comfort and your families and everything familiar to go bless others. Stay in safety in your tidy little comfortable life and you'll bless no one. Go ahead, keep locking it away. Keep security. Be a little happy and you'll bless no one. You need to share the gospel maybe or confront someone and we don't do it because I want to stay in my safety zone and not ruffle the feathers and I'll never be a blessing. Get out and bless you. God blessed you and you will be a blessing. So from Abram's seed, I'm going to make a great nation. And later Jacob would be born and he's the father of 12 sons and they will become the 12 tribes of Israel. And a great nation then is going to come forth from Abraham and they're going to be the covenant people of God. That is the great plan of redemption is going to come forth from Israel and the seed is going to come from this great nation. What a blessing that God has given to Abraham. This promise will be flushed out fuller in the context of Genesis because later a child would be born from the union of Abraham and Sarah at 190 years old. And there's going to be a point of doubt and struggle with the aged man before that. And God then would take Abraham out and he's going to say, look at the stars, count them, which you could have spent the rest of your life counting those stars. So shall your descendants be. He brings them to the seashore and says, look at the grains of the sand, count them, and so shall your descendants be. This is an amazing promise that God has given to Abraham. And Abraham is trying to solve it in the flesh And he takes Sarah's slave named Hagar and he tries to have a kid that way. And he's born Ishmael, who's been a problem for the Jews ever since. Abraham finally, ultimately trusts God that he's going to do what he says. And he will have a son. And again, God gives him a son at 190 years old. And his name is Isaac. Laughter. The faith of Abraham was so sweet. And after that son was born, when he's a teenager, God calls Abraham now, go sacrifice him. And he he obeyed God and it made no sense at all. But faith in the promise of God, God stopped him and gave him a ram in the thicket as an offering. God provided a sacrifice and said, Abraham, now I know that you are fully surrendered to me. And it's so sweet that the line of promise then is going to continue. How? 
by the miraculous hand of God. A child born to a 100-year-old and a 90-year-old will keep this seed promise alive and going. The sovereign grace of God. And so it does to this day. That is how God gets children, is by his sovereign hand. And the last point is all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I'll give you a nation. I'll make a great family out of you. And, and all, the, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. The nations have just been scattered, haven't they? And God says, Abraham, I have a plan to bring them all back to myself. And it's going to come through you, your seed, Abraham. Not just the, uh, the nation that he would raise up for Abraham, but all the nations. The blessing here he's talking is salvation. It's bringing them back to God. And I'm going to bless all the nations, Abraham, through your seed and bringing them back to God through that seed. Listen to Revelation 7, 9. And after these things I looked, said John, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, all the tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches are in their hands as they're worshiping the seed. How do I know you'll do this, God? How do I know you'll do this, Abraham asked. And I preached on this a while back, so I won't park on it. But in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. And the way he makes this covenant is you, you would cut these animals in half. It was turtle doves and rams and I, I forget all the, there was four kinds of animals and birds. And you cut them in half and you would spread them. And, and what would happen is the two parties, as they made an agreement, they would walk through that. And the agreement was, if I don't keep this covenant that we're making, may I be cut in half and destroyed like these animals. And so it was very common to do this. And they would walk through together and making the covenant. And the strangest thing happens with this covenant. Abraham doesn't walk through the animals. God walks through. And, and what he's saying is, Abraham, is this covenant is going to happen. And I'm the one who's going to do everything necessary to bless the nations through this seed. It's going to have nothing to do with you, Abraham. Your, your works, who you are, nothing. It, this has nothing to do with you. I'm going to keep my covenant and I'm going to do all the conditions that are required to bring men back to God. The full responsibility for the fulfillment of the covenant is God will bless Abraham and his seed by God alone. This is so amazing. Because in a few chapters, Abraham's going to sin. And he's going to give his wife to a king and say, she's my sister. <laughs> Chicken. Jacob, his grandson, is going to be called the deceiver. One of his kids are going to be sleeping with a concubine and rape a stepsister. And God doesn't wipe them out. Why? Because the covenant is what I have done. It's not what you're going to do, Abraham, or your descendants. The way to keep this covenant of blessing is what I will do to bring salvation to the world. This covenant blessing from God is not based on what we do. Some of you still sit here every Sunday thinking that way. But it's what God has done. Which is what? How will God bless the nations through Abraham? There's still a sword at the gate. How do you just say, I'm going to bless nations and I'm going to do everything. Come on, Abraham, come back to God. You forgot something. There's a big sword of justice that moves in every direction. So God, how are you going to bring blessing through this seed to the nations? There's a big problem. And so there's got to be a way to fix this. There's got to be a way to bless people. And you can't bless sinners separated from God who are guilty and have to be destroyed. God has to come up with a plan of the wisdom of God for how to bridge this together. So this blessing to Abraham means nothing if a seed doesn't come later to bring about how God could bless Abraham by free grace and him doing it all and giving him this mercy and salvation. Something needed to happen. And Abraham's going to put his faith in this seed that would come. So as we close out, if everyone would just flip over to Galatians 3. Uh, just for sake of time, we're saving 2,000 years. And I, th I want you to be blown away with now the fullness of the times explaining 
who the seed is and what he did and how could God bless the nations through this seed. And this is probably the most amazing truth I've ever seen is God's uh, going to now bring it all together in this infinite wisdom and explain it. And this really should take your breath away if you'll journey with me through this. Galatians 3.10. Let's start in verse 9. I like that. Let's go in verse 8. Last time. Verse 6. Abraham believed God. We just looked at it. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Righteousness was put to his account because he believed what God said and what he would do. Therefore, be sure that it's those who are of the faith who are sons of Abraham. How do I get to be a son of Abraham? By faith. And you're going to see that you receive the fullness of the blessings. I'm brought in to these blessings that he said he would give to Abraham. I'm now a son of Abraham by faith. And I'm going to receive this blessing that's going to go to the nations. So the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to who? To Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. That was the pre God preaching the gospel back then, saying that all the nations are going to be blessed in you. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many are of the works of the law are under a curse. So if you get under the law, the law promised two things, that it would bring blessing if you obeyed it and cursings if you disobeyed it. And so those who are under the, the works of the law, you're under a curse because it's presuming that you're going to blow it. And, and what does it say? For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by what? All things written in the book of the law to perform them. So unless you obey this law perfect, you're cursed. You're under God's condemnation. The wrath of God is upon you. If you're under the law, you have to keep it perfectly. And no one can do that since the fall. So Paul is assuming you're cursed. So verse 11, now that no one then is justified by the law before God is absolutely evident. You're not going to get right with God by trying to be a good person and keeping God's law. That you'll never get right with God by trying that. So the righteous man shall live by faith. And that, that's a beautiful context. It's, um, I don't want to get too lost here, but in Habakkuk 2.4 is where that comes from. And the Babylonians are about to come and destroy Israel, take them captive, and they're going to be sitting there going, where's the promise of the seed? There, there's, we're, Israel, we're not even a nation anymore. We've been taken captive and we're brought in here and we're idol worshipers. And, and you're just looking saying, is there any hope? The just shall live by faith. The ones who believe what God said, and he is going to bring forth a redeemer. He will bring you back in. And so here it is. You've got to live by faith in the promise. Verse 12, however, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, who, he who practices them shall live by them. It's a, it's a law of works, not faith. Verse 13, Christ then redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so God has to condemn and punish sin. And Christ was up on a cross being condemned because we broke this law. Our curse, our scourgings were poured out on the Son of God hanging on a cross. He was cursed. In order, in verse 14, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. But notice what he does not say, and to seeds plural, as referring to many, but rather to, to one. It's singular. It's going to be, the nations are going to be blessed through what? Seed. Singular, that is Christ. So the blessing to Abraham is that it's going to be, the blessings are going to come through a singular seed, through Jesus Christ, that the nations are going to get the blessings. And what I'm saying then is this. And so here, here, here's my question before I read that. Is, here's a blessing. I'm going to bless you by grace through faith 
Abraham. All you do is believe. I'm going to do all the conditions of the covenant to bring you in. I'm going to bless through your seed. Well, I just got one question. Why 430 years later did you bring in the law? Why bring uh, the, the whole Mosaic law? And, and it comes and, and all of a sudden, is if you keep it, you'll live. And if you break it, you're going to die. So here's this beautiful promise. And now why bring in a law that you have to keep? And if you don't, you get destroyed. And, and so it, it just looks contrary. He's going to ask, isn't that contrary to a promise? Didn't the law come and invalidate it? And I'll tell you this, the law did. If the law was, if it was us who was supposed to fulfill that law, it's completely contradictory to the promise to Abraham. But what I'm about to show you is that law was never given for you to keep it. It was given for the seed, the perfect son who had come into this world, who would perfectly keep it and fulfill the whole law and not destroy it. That way that it could still be the promise by grace and everything that he did. So what I'm about to show you is the law and, and the promise to Abraham are married and beautiful and joined together and people spend their whole lives tripping over it, trying to keep law to get the blessing that God promised to Abraham. So let's look at how Paul now marries this perfectly in verse 17. So what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God when he walked through those animals so as to nullify the promise. So it, it never nullified. The law did not break what God made a covenant. I will bless the nations. I'll do it. It's coming through me. Verse 18, if you'll just believe. For if the inheritance is based on law, it's no longer based on a promise. It wouldn't work. But God has granted it to Abraham by what? By the means of a promise. Why the law then? It doesn't make sense. Well, it was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Until Christ would come, this law was keeping them in, in check. It's, a, it's a now... Verse 20, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? It should be. Paul says, may genetai, may it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life through your keeping, then righteousness would have indeed had been based on the law. But the scriptures has shut up everyone under sin. The law has come and it's just shut you up and it's made you guilty. So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed through Christ. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we might be justified by faith. And so the law came to show you what you are before God. And it was to show you that by your own efforts and your own washing and cleaning yourself up, you will never get right with God. It was to show you so thoroughly how deep your sin is and how great your problem is that you would finally look and say, I'll never be able to keep this law. There's nothing in me that will ever be able to fulfill it. I need something outside of me greater. And that that law then would lead you to the one who was going to come and perfectly fulfill it so that in Christ you might have this salvation. Verse 25, now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. And I want some of you to hear that. You're no longer under this law. You're no longer under this law to keep it, to get acceptance with God. Law was given. Christ came and fulfilled it. Done. You're no longer under it. You're now in law to Jesus Christ. He's now our standard, our example in everything. And so I want you to quit living under Mosaic law. If I can just do this, keep the Lord's day, be a better dad, and do all these things, God will love me. Die to that. It was given to kill you so that you'll quit trying to merit your way to God's love and acceptance. Let the law kill you. Be done with it. Let your bootstraps break this morning. Quit looking to your hands and your moralism and let it tutor you to the seed, to Jesus Christ. Verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 
And there's neither Jew nor Greek. I, I was just born to the wrong kind of family. It doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek any longer. In Christ, we're one. It, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are or not, whether you're a slave or a free man. Whether it's just my gender is my problem. Whether neither male nor female. For now we are all one in Jesus Christ. And I love every nation represented here, different walks of life. It's just every one of us now, we all have an equal footing of oneness with God and with each other through Christ. So beautiful. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. I was in Genesis 12, and now I'm a son of Abraham because I have the faith of Abraham to be blessed with the seed that came from his loins, that came to fulfill the covenant that God had promised. So do you see how the law and this promise marry perfectly? They're not opposed. If it, if it was you having to keep it, they're opposed. They're, they're contradictory. But instead, God gave us a gift called law to silence us and shut our mouths and show us what we really are, to lead us to the beautiful one who kept every part of this covenant so that he could bring us back to God in Genesis 3 where man dwelt with this beautiful God. Amen? Any questions? <laughs> I can't get over that. That's what was born that day in Bethlehem's manger. And so I want to close with one last thought. 2,000 years after this promise was made to Abraham, 2,000 years when he said, I'll bless the nations through your seed, it just looks like all hope is lost. It, it didn't happen. It's, it's broken. God forgot he had to have maybe come up with a new plan. It's just been too long. And all of a sudden, an angel comes named Gabriel and he appears to a virgin named Mary and says, the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow you and you're going to be with a child, the Most High God, the Holy One. You're going to have a holy embryo inside of you who's fully human and fully God. He remembered. Uh, she breaks out into this most amazing song called the Magnificat. And she says that God has shown mercy because he remembered his promise to Abraham. And so 2,000 years later, she gets it. He kept his promise. He's going to bless the nations through the seed that is inside my womb right now. And she's marveling and worshiping God for how amazing he is. And Zacharias is going to come and say the same thing. And we're going to park on those songs in, in four more weeks, the Sunday before Christmas. But now, they waited 2,000 years for a promise then that God made to Abraham, and boom, it happens. Why? Because God is faithful to his promise. It wasn't based on how bad Israel was or what they did. God is faithful to his promises. And now, guys, 2,000 years later, we sit here, and we're awaiting the promise of the consummation of these promises of Christ coming back and making all things new. So we live in the already, I tell you before, of salvation, but the not yet of Christ finishing it. And that is where God's going to reverse the curse completely with death and nature and all that we face. It's coming. And it's been a long time again. And we live in what historians call the post-Christian era. And we're told the church is irrelevant, the death of God. And it's been thousands of years. Where's your Jesus? They're mocking we're considered fools and very shallow thinkers. But there's still a remnant who have not lost faith in the promise of God. I get up to it every morning. I can't lose sight of this promise of a God who's faithful and he's going to do the exact same thing he did to Mary in keeping this full orbed promise that he made. He's faithful. He made a covenant and he took an oath. He swore by himself, I will do this. And he will return and the sky will open up and he will come and undo completely the works of the devil. Death and sin and Satan and the world system and nature. And God will bless the nations through the seed of Abraham who was born of a virgin for every tribe, tongue, and nation who will have the faith of Abraham. And so the gospel now is spreading and it's going to the nations and everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved and brought into the Abrahamic blessing that God made 4,000 years ago. 
you are as much an heir of that promise as Abraham was if you believe. And this covenant, praise the Lord, is not based on my faithfulness because I would give up on me. But it's based on His so that you can be absolutely certain of your salvation because He raised that seed up from the dead and said He accomplished it. It's finished. Salvation in Yahweh's Son, Jesus. And those who have the faith of Abraham who look at that seed in faith will be blessed. So come thou long expected Jesus to God be the glory. Isn't that sweet? And uh, next week we're going to have communion. And then the following week we're going to look at this seed uh, is going to be a king who sits on a throne and his kingdom will have no end. And then we'll come to Isaiah and just, it just so happens that that seed's name is Emmanuel. God with us. And then we're going to come to that manger and we're going to look at the beauty of a whole 2,000 year fulfillment. And all of us who will call on this name and believe will be saved. Amen? So if you're not a believer, you're missing out. <laughs> believe. Who, who could come up with a plan like that? How do, you, how do you do that? How do you control history and make all this stuff come to pass so beautifully? Just call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That is the message for you this morning. And, and believers just marvel and worship at this beautiful plan of God. I, I cannot get over it. I love him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for this gorgeous plan. I thank you for that seed that was born in a manger. I thank you for the promise and that you would bless the nations through this little one. I thank you that he grew up and this one went to a cross and there he hung in our place for all of the covenant breaking that we've done. God, he hung. Cursed is the one who breaks the law and he was there cursed and drew your full wrath for three hours. I thank you that he came and he lived the life that we should have. He obeyed the law. He fulfilled it. He gave uh, the, the fulfillment of what it means to be a true son of God and how to live and trust and obey you. Thank you, God, that now you look at us and that righteousness is ours. The reason we can be made acceptable is not our own righteousness. It's a filthy rag. But it's the gorgeous, brilliant, beautiful righteousness of Jesus Christ that we're now placed in and as a garment is wrapped around us, we are in Christ. I thank you, God, that all has been taken care of, that you can now bless us with the fullness of what you promised to Abraham. God, thank you for the blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. Let every heart be overwhelmed with the amazing mercy of our God. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. All God's people said. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.